Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. As we're rolling through the candidates, Republican candidates for governor of Arizona, Ken Bennett, of course, your secretary of state, and he's certainly on the list. Good to see you. Good to see you, John. We haven't had you for a while. We haven't had you on the program. It's good to be here. Thank good you. to see you. Um, as we look at this crowded field mm -hmm. right now, if you had just a couple of seconds to tell folks watching right now how you're different or you're a better choice than the other what do we have now in the six, Republican primary? Six in the Republican I've lost track because <laughs> Andrew Thomas, sometimes he's there, sometimes he's not. Um, well, we had Senator Melvin. He dropped he out. He dropped but out. We're, we're at six, and it looks like that's what it's going to be. What defines Ken Bennett? Two words. Uh, experience matters. Uh, almost 30 years of experience in the private sector. Uh, and then during that same 30 years, uh, a variety of experience in the public sector starting on the city council up in Prescott, mm -hmm. which gave me, I felt, a very good foundation for understanding how important local government is, because later when I would find myself in the state legislature, it reminded me that the state cannot balance its budget on the backs of the cities and towns and counties. Let's and go so, back to the private experience. Okay. Where did that private experience come? Well, what did you do? Almost 24 years running a family business. My grandparents started with some gas stations up in the Prescott area. Uh, they go way back in Prescott. Grandma and Grandpa's phone number was 49. In fact, that was their home number. The station was 71. Um, so we've been in Prescott a long time. Wow. And then my parents bought that business. Uh, I was born in Tucson when my parents were going to the University of Arizona. Uh, Dad got a degree in agriculture, and we were supposed to be cotton farmers. Uh, but the owner of the farm uh, wanted the job my dad had. So mm -hmm. my parents bought uh, the gas stations and the fuel distribution business that my grandparents had had there. What did it so teach I, I grew What up, did that uh, teach you? Well, I grew up. You know, my first job was uh, walking across the street from an elementary school and cleaning out the coins uh, from an automated car wash that we had in one of our gas stations. I bet that made a lot of money. Uh, it did pretty good. <laughs> I thought it was a ton of money. I'd see all these quarters in my hand and, you know, but I had to restock the wash and the wax and, and clean off the dirt and everything. And, and so it taught me to work hard. Elbow worked, grease. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up uh, driving trucks and tankers for my dad, have hundreds of, of stories of uh, driving truck around Arizona delivering gasoline so, and diesel fuel. So that shapes you? How mm -hmm. does your faith shape you? You're LDS. How does that shape you, know, you as well? LDS. Well, I was raised in a family that, uh, you know, a strong belief in who you are and, and, you know, you're a child of God and you treat other people with respect and because they're your brothers and sisters and, um, you know, there's others watching, you know, How what, what you do, uh, just because you don't think somebody's watching doesn't mean that, uh, you have a free ride. To right, go, character yeah. is what, ha yeah. what you do yeah, when no one's watching. Doing, because God's always watching. Okay, now on that score, how does somebody who feels that way and looks at their life that way end up in the nasty, ugly world of politics? <laughs> well, the nasty, ugly world of politics to me is the world that some choose to make it into. Uh, I've never felt it uh, that nasty, and, and sometimes I get the reputation of being too nice a guy. But when I served in the state senate, for example, you were Senate President. I was Senate President for four years. And the Republicans had a small uh, majority, a narrow majority. But, uh, you know, we worked together with Republicans and Democrats to get good things done. And we did some things that we felt were important as, as conservative Republicans, cutting taxes and, and saving money for a rainy day. But we also put more new money into, into K-12 education. Uh, during those four years than any other four years in the history of the state. In the Republican primary, it seems that the winner has to tact as far to the right as they possibly can to win. And this conversely happens on the Democratic side. To win the primary, you've uh, got to tact as far to the left as you can. How do you carve out that when you've got four or five people saying, I'm the most conservative, no, I'm the most conservative, no, I am. Well, How are you different than these other folks? Uh, six in the primary. I think actually sets up an interesting dynamic where all six can't, of course, they be cancel to the right. each other out. They, you can't be to the right of everybody. Are else. you saying you're a little more moderate than no, they are? No, I'm saying that I am who I am. I, I'm conservative Republican, but I also deal with people in a respectful manner, and I listen, and I'll meet with people who have different opinions than I do. And every week, I would meet with the legislative leadership in the Senate when I was president, and I was the head of the Republican caucus. Um, but, you know, of, of the hundreds of legislators that I served with in my eight years, the leader of the Democrat caucus, Linda Aguirre, for the same four years I was Senate president, I probably put her in the top five of all the hundreds of legislators that I served with. So I think or hope that we prove that you can stay uh, grounded mm -hmm. in your own principles, but you don't have to treat people with, with uh, 
ill will, and you got to realize that they're they're wanting to accomplish the same good things that you want to. You might have some differences as to how to get there. Yeah. Uh, and you stand your ground when you have to, but you also find ways to create a win-win solution and get things done. Let's roll tape number one. I want to get your, this is, this is in Oracle. And I know this area well. It's not far from the biosphere, mm -hmm. and I used to work in Tucson. There's an ugliness to this, but there's a truth to it also, isn't there? That people are saying, wait a minute, this is insanity. Yeah. Well, I think people are kind of fed up. What do you, what do you uh, make of sides. this? What I, what I make of this is that... Um, for almost 30 years, the federal government under Republican and Democrat administrations has, has failed to secure our border and provide a way for people to come in to our country the, the right way. Mm -hmm. And so you got all kinds of people kind of sneaking in the back door. What does a uh, governor do to bridge that gap? And what can a governor do? And I asked you, you this at a debate today earlier. What can a governor in Arizona do to fix that? Or can they? Well, you can't fix it by yourself. Controlling the border, and having a, a workable immigration policy is a, is a primary responsibility of the federal government. But I think there are things that the state can do and should do. And obviously there are some gaps in, in what the federal government is doing that uh, has given rise to the situation. Mm -hmm. So that what would you do in. as governor? Obviously. What I would do is what we did in 2006 when I was in the Senate. And we passed legislation that would, would get resources to the local law enforcement, sheriffs and local law enforcement agencies along the border. As I talk to the sheriffs in Cochise County and Yuma County and, and along the border, they tell me that some of what the federal government has done to secure the border has indeed accomplished that in the areas of the ports of entry and in the high population areas. I've seen it. I've walked yeah. it. I, I've seen that area. And, and, you know, and the fencing, you. Yeah, you the fencing Yuma, is yeah. substantial now. Right. You, you can't can, cross there. Right. You go to the Yuma sector and you're either coming in the front door or you're not coming in. Right. And, and Thousands of further people out a day. you get from thousands, the city yeah, centers. Thousands though, of then. people a day come across there in Yuma to, yep. to work in the fields sure. and, and do that. But what that's done is it's funneled the illegal activity out into the more rural parts and more dangerous parts. Well, and then you end up with uh, Rob Krentz's being shot on his own mm -hmm. ranch and Brian Terry's and uh, and so what they tell me is that if we can get some resources from the state to them, the, the local sheriffs and, and local law enforcement, they could help to fill in the gaps. Um, and, and even the bill that we passed even had the authorization for the National Guard to be down there doing training exercises. Would you and, favor that? Well, yes, but in a very limited role. There's, not, there's only so many things that the National Guard can do. They can't directly interdict or arrest people. Uh, they can do observation. They can do other types of support things. But the, the main thing is working together with the federal government to, to help fill in the gaps of a porous border right now. Let me ask you about education. Mm -hmm. it's, it's maybe... Well, let me ask you, I'll leave it open to you. Okay. What is job one in this state right now? <laughs> job one is tied between growing our economy and improving our education system because one has I, so I much to do. I knew we were going to say one or the other. <laughs> there, one has so much to do with the other. Okay. Um, we're not going to attract uh, companies to Arizona or keep the companies that are starting and growing here. Uh, we're not going to attract those companies or keep them without the talent that they need to make their company successful. And so improving our education system is very, very important. Uh, and I think it's kind of tied with uh, job growth. I'm running for governor for jobs, children, protect our freedoms, and quit shooting ourselves in the foot. <laughs> and okay, so, on, on education, so on, on education. Um, I've heard, say, Fred Duval, uh, mm -hmm. who's running on the, on the Democratic side. One of you will face Fred Duval mm -hmm. with all likelihood. He has said, I will not cut any more out of education. We've done as much as we can to try to balance a budget, but we cannot go any further with education. Do you agree with that position? Well, we didn't cut education when I was in the Senate. There was a couple years where we, you know, kind of had to live within our means, and maybe you got kind of what you got last year with maybe a little bit of increases. The second two years of, of me being Senate president, we, we had the resources because of a growing economy mm -hmm. to put over $640 million of new funding into education. And what did that get us? Well, uh, we made sure that half of it, a half of it went into just keeping up with student growth and the inflation adjustment that's required in state law. Um, the other half we made sure was getting into the classroom instead of going into lost in the shuffle of administration and that. Did we have so, a better product during that time? We did. We were improving. Uh, Test scores were improving. Well. What I like to uh, talk about in education is I toured a school in South Tucson a few months ago. 
And about the time that I was leaving as Senate president and we had put these resources in, a new principal showed up in that school, Steve Trejo. This is a school that's in a very low income area, high poverty. 92% of the students are below the federal poverty level. And when Steve got there as the principal, there was about, he says, uh, only about 20% of the kids could read at grade level. Six years later, it's 75%. And I asked him, I said, how'd you do that? And he said three things that I can recall. One was we, we started talking to the students about the fact that they, more than anyone else, were responsible, the, they were the most responsible per person for their own education. Two, we changed the culture. We started talking about high expectations. And three, we got some resources into the classroom, and I think these may have been some resources that we had put in not too long before. And he said we hired teacher assistants and got uh, our, our teacher uh, salaries up a little bit, and we got resources into the classroom. So if a teacher had 25 or 30 kids and a handful were falling behind, there was somebody that could work with them and get them caught back This up. is a public school, this not a, public, a charter. No, this is a public they school. They turned it around. They turned it around in about five or six years. That would be your model? That would be my model. Where my was model that? Would be Do you recall to, where that was in Tucson? It's called C.E. Rose Elementary School. I'm trying to remember um, where that is in Tucson. I don't recall the, uh, um, the specific location, but I think it uh, might be off. Well, anyway, it's in, South, it's in one of the South, toughest. South Tucson? It's South Tucson, okay. you know, toughest parts. Out, out of that, you talk about how you've got to have a proper education platform to attract jobs. Mm -hmm. What do we do now to try to get this economy rolling in Arizona? Or do you think it's starting to? Well, it's, it's too slow right now. But, but I think there are four things to get the economy growing. And one is money, the cost of doing business in Arizona, what kind of tax policies and things do you think do we there's create? too much tax on business in Arizona? No, um, yeah, I think there's a, a few places where we need to improve. Our, our property taxes on businesses is still double what it is for uh, us as individuals. Uh, the business personal property tax, which generates very little amount of, of the revenue for the state, but makes it very onerous for our high tech and manufacturing type companies, uh, research and development and things like that. When you create a manufacturing job in Arizona, that creates two other jobs somewhere else. You create a research and development job in Arizona, almost to 1.8. Most other jobs, retail and things like that, you create less than one job somewhere else. So, so what would be so the, the biggest four thing things, you could do? The four things for economic development. Money, what's the cost of doing business in Arizona? Two is talent. That's improving our education system. Three is time. That's all the bureaucracy and red tape and all the uh, things that you have to do. And we have an opportunity to continue to reduce the, the regulatory burdens and all the, the red tape that make it hard, harder to do business in Arizona than it should. I've, I've talked to companies trying to get started in Arizona. and They've got a two to three year timeline before they think they're going to be up and running and just getting all their permits. One more thing before we go to break. Do you believe in giving incentives, tax incentives, to businesses to move here? I prefer creating a broad-based environment that works more like a, a magnet or a, a, a vacuum that attracts all kinds of businesses and also helps the ones that are here, rather than what I call the lasso approach, where we, we hear about one company here or there and we're going to throw a tax Give me an example of a city doing it the way you'd like to do it. A city? Yeah. Can you think of another city in the country that does it the way you like to do it? Well, I think How does Austin do it? Well, uh, Austin is within a state, for example, where there's no state sales tax, right. no state income tax. So you're saying that tax climate makes Austin I, very attractive. I think it's... The university well, think, there does, part too. Of it. I think, yeah, you've got talent uh, that's there, and people know it. You've got a tax climate that is low and... and why are we always competing against Austin for companies? It seems like it comes down to Phoenix and Austin. Well, a lot of times, if they're not looking at California or, yeah. or if they're fleeing California. Well, and um, I, I think it's uh, the tax policy. I think it's the talent. Uh, I think it's the Southwest. It's, it's the you know, clean air and the, and the sunshine and so many other things that they kind of have like we have. But we, we, can, we, can, we can do better than they are doing. We'll take a break with Ken Bennett, your Secretary of State running for governor on the Republican side in Arizona. Back with Ken Bennett in a minute. Back on Newsmaker Sunday with Ken Bennett, your Secretary of State running for governor on the Republican side. What defines you? What defines me? Um, faith, family, country. In uh, that order. Uh, probably. Yeah. yeah. What has been the biggest thing you've learned in public life? 
biggest thing. What's the I, best lesson you've learned you know, in public life? One of the life? best lessons I've learned is that no one or no thing is as good as their proponents say it is or as bad as the opponents. The reality of almost anything or anyone is usually somewhere in between those that say it's great, the greatest thing since whatever, or those that say it's the worst thing since Does whatever. Does that go for and your so opponents as well? That that as they, everybody gets caricatured in a political campaign. Well, I don't. I'm not running in this race against my opponents. I'm running for governor. You have not and will not see me run negative ads or talk in any way about tearing someone else down to try to make me look better. Okay, I'm going to so, put you on the spot now. That's fine. You're the de facto lieutenant governor in this state as Secretary of State. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This has happened time and time again in Arizona. It happened uh -huh. with Jan Brewer. It right. happened with Jane Hall. It yeah. happened with Janet Napolitano. I think five of the last uh, eight or nine governors got there by ascending when, when you know, there was a vacancy in the office. You are the governor in waiting right now. If something were if to something happen. If something happened to Jan Brewer in the next uh, six months, I'd be the governor. Okay, this is where I put you on the spot. Okay. If you were governor, mm -hmm. out of the rest of this field, who would you want to be your lieutenant governor if we had one? Out of this field, who would be the next best thing to Ken Bennett in this field? I would probably say um, Smith or Ducey, maybe. Smith, ha Smith has the experience of having worked at the local government level and would be very keen on making sure that the state is not uh, balancing its budget on the backs of the local cities. Thank uh, you for answering this, because I have a real hard time getting candidates well, to answer that question. Well, most of them, oh, that's been asked of, of us in I think in I asked it of all of you in the Salt River debate, Salt River and, and Project And no one would give you an answer, I think, except me. And so I, I have no problem uh, admitting that there are other good people in this race. And I respect that, uh, but, uh, you know, almost all of us have had business experience. Uh, some of us have had experience at other levels of government. Uh, I bring, as the unique one of the six, experience in the legislature. I was the CEO of the Senate for four years. And you think that's and, important? And very, very important. To get things done. M one of the most important things that a governor has to do is work with the legislature. Because even when you as governor want to do ABC, you've got 90 other people in the right. legislature that want to do DEF and XYZ. And let, let, me roll, let me roll tape, uh, okay. what did I call for, James? Tape four? <laughs> yes. Uh, Charles Flanagan, who was a guest on this program. That's Charles, Charles Flanagan's Flanagan an impressive guy. He's the new know? head of the old CPS. It's now Department of Child Safety, DCS. Right. CS, right. Charles Flanagan told me on this program, he said, I'm okay with the funding we've got right now. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be okay right now dealing with this crisis of, of kids in crisis in Arizona. But I'm afraid what's going to happen in the years coming. Would you continue to try to fund these guys at the level they're at right now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they I, need it. They need it. Um, I think as we solve some of the fundamental issues related to our economy that's affecting our families, that we should start, hopefully we will start to see a reduction in the complaints and the claims coming in uh, that have just exploded over the last few years. Why I is think, this so <clears throat> important we fix this? Well, there's no one more vulnerable, vulnerable in our society than children. And if we can't take care of our children, then I think we fail as a society. Would you have favored uh, the Medicaid expansion that the governor signed on for? I would not have. Uh, I would not have supported or signed the bill th that she signed uh, because I think it needed a little more work on what are we going to do when the federal government drops below the 80 percent? Because if we've put hundreds of thousands of new people on that program, and then the federal government bl drops below 80, it's it, ours. Yeah. So I think we've got to pay for yeah. it. Uh, and so I have a five. 5-5 five, five plan to address our needs and access. And Do you want to get into it now or to send people to the website? Well, they can go to the website, BennettArizona.com. But it's basically moving 5% of people on access over to private health insurance through an employer, getting people into jobs that can pay their, uh, their health care. 5% uh, by moving them over to uh, a pilot program with health savings accounts so that they are connected to the decisions they make on their health care. And then 5% reduction by eliminating fraud, waste, and abuse, and drug testing. Let's roll tape number three back here. So, What's your relationship governor with Governor Brewer? Where has she succeeded and where has she failed in your view? Well, Governor Brewer, I have a good relationship with Governor Brewer, 
But she's busy being the governor and I'm busy being secretary of state. So it's not like we see each other on a daily mm -hmm. basis. We may see each other once every few weeks, if at the most, maybe. Uh, and I wish it was a little more. If I get to be the governor, I want to have a, a, a closer, more day-to-day -day working relationship with whoever is in the number two spot. Okay. Um, I, the governor, Governor Brewer inherited the worst financial crisis that any governor in this state has ever had to deal with. And she did a great job of almost getting us back to balance. And so I think that you have to say that the tough decisions that she made to uh, deal with... Part of that was the Medicaid expansion. I yes. mean, that was saying, look, we're going we're gonna to take the Fed's lifeline yeah. here because we don't have the money for this. But even before Medicaid expansion, she came into office. The state was spending almost $11 billion a year, and the revenue was coming in less than $8 billion, almost a $3.5 mm -hmm. billion dollar hole. So you think she's managed the crisis pretty well? She has done a good job at managing what, the crisis. Where, where would you depart with her? I would, I would probably depart in the fact that we haven't quite got back to balance. We're still overspending each year by about $400 million. And so we have a structural deficit. It's much smaller than it was when she came in. But we haven't quite got back to balance. Um, last year we were spending 8.8 uh, and 8.4 coming in. Next year they say that the revenue is going to come up to about 8.8, but they increased the spending to 9.2. So you'd hold a line on spending. I, I would you probably, would really try to. I would probably. I, I think we need to get back to a, a truly balanced budget, without balancing it on the backs of local cities and towns. We need to uh, quit taking perf monies to maintain the roads from cities and towns. So, ironically, the thing that she's done best is dealing with the financial crisis. And I guess the one place that I would differ <laughs> is that she hasn't quite got it done. And I look forward to doing it. We're back to, with Ken Bennett, Secretary of State running for governor on the Republican side, back in a minute on Newsmaker Sunday. Back with Secretary of State Ken Bennett, of course, running for governor of Arizona. You want to eliminate the state income tax. Yes. That. How do you pull that off and then find it somewhere else? Well, we can tax people in one of two ways. You can take part of their income and or you can tax as they consume things. The Founding Fathers, I don't think, ever intended that government would take part of our income, or else it wouldn't have been necessary to adopt the 16th Amendment to allow the federal government to tax our incomes. So I think they always intended to collect taxes as people consume, because then a person's tax burden is directly proportional to their standard of living, how much they spend. And so if you have a very low rate tax on as many transactions in the economy, you can collect the same amount of money that we collect with a income and the sales tax that we have right now. Doesn't it hurt the poor though? No. In fact, uh, you can, by deciding which transactions to, to tax, you c I would not do it if you had to shift the tax burden from one group to another. I want to be tax, I want to be revenue neutral. We're talking about collecting the same amount of tax. But the, the economy of Arizona is usually measured in GDP. It's right. about $280 billion. If you had a three and a half percent tax every time a transaction occurred, that would collect $9 billion, which is the same $9 billion yeah. we collect with income and sales tax. If you needed to exclude some transactions to help it from hurting the poor or whatever, you could exclude up to $100 billion of that 280 with a 5% rate, and you'd still collect the same amount. Where are so, we at here, James? 30 seconds? Yeah, we got about 30. Okay. I want to, for okay. people who don't know you, what would you like to say to voters right now about what makes you tick and why you're the person for the job? Well, I'm a husband and a father and a grandfather. I was born in Arizona. I love Arizona. And I have proven in 30 years of business and 25 years of public service that I have the experience to get things done. And as governor, probably most importantly, is working in the legislative process as president of the Senate, bringing people together from both parties and getting things done. When we passed budgets during my Senate presidency, it was with the majority of both parties supporting those budgets. Ken Bennett, great to see you. Good to see Good you. Good to have you back on the program. Thanks, John. Happy picking. He's a guitar player as well. <laughs> we'll see you next week on Newsmaker Sunday. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it. Thanks, John.